So today we want to look at rights of the accused, and we'll anchor this in the AP required case of Gideon v. Wainwright. We won't go into the heavy details of that because you've studied that already. But I do want to point out on this opening slide the concept that Robert Kennedy offers us, the idea that this obscure poor man decided to sit down in his prison cell and draft a request to the Supreme Court. And in doing that, the vast machinery is almost like this cog in the machine that alters our history. And if we shift then to the comment by Justice Black, he's going to speak about this letter and this issue being fundamental to a fair trial. So we want to look at, we want to step before Gideon and go beyond Gideon. So if we do this, we want to look at these fundamental rights that we'll be talking about here. We'll be looking then at the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments. Gideon itself, we're going to focus on the sixth, but in this larger sense of rights of the accused, we'll, we'll address these three amendments. And I've highlighted some critical points. And I want you to remember the concepts of unreasonable searches and the need for a warrant and probable cause. But if we move into the fifth, we'll see a little bit about double jeopardy and incriminating yourself. We're going to focus on the concept of due process. Property clause is, is, is a separate issue here. In the Sixth Amendment, we look at the issues of trial, jury, and uh, the right to have counsel. So let's take a look here. Some terms that we'll keep using and hearing, this exclusionary rule that we've discussed in class. This is when evidence is gathered without appropriate constitutional means becomes the fruit of the poison tree. Probable cause and reasonableness. There are two different terms that interrelate, and we'll want to keep those in mind. What is a search? What can be seized? Who can be searched? And then we'll look at some exceptions here. So if you keep going here and we look at the case of Gideon, if you remember, Gideon himself was a poor man who was con uh, charged, arrested, and brought to trial for a crime. He couldn't afford an attorney, so he represented himself, and he was found guilty. In prison, he learned a little bit, and he drafted a letter requesting that his case be revisited. He got some assistance in this. And in doing this, his case will end up focusing on the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, but also the incorporation element of the 14th Amendment, especially the Due Process Clause. The Supreme Court prior to this case had required the right to counsel in capital cases, and where he lived, Florida, abided by that, but not in less severe felonies, still severe crimes, but not capital crimes. So the case that is decided here by the Supreme Court and um, becomes such a precedent setting one is, is going to be part of the idea that all criminal defendants will receive, in felony cases, will receive representation. In doing this, you see below that it overturns the case of Betts v. Brady that had chosen to not require states to abide by that. The Alabama case in 1932 was the one that required it for capital cases. After Gideon, you have Escobedo that extends the right to counsel to not, not simply during trial, but before, while you're being held, questioned, detained, etc. And then ultimately, ultimately, just over about a decade after um, uh, Gideon, in the case of 1972, we add the right to counsel for smaller imprisonable offenses and misdemeanors. In the four years after Gideon, we extend, the court extends rights to, uh, to the accused to confront witnesses and to bring witnesses on your behalf. All of these are taking what were respected at the federal level and mandating that states abide by that. If we look beyond the right to counsel, Part of the Sixth Amendment also brings in the jury. So for most of our, our history, the state could determine who could sit on juries. And up until, eight, uh, up until the 1960s, a number of states forbade women, forbade African Americans from serving on juries. And in 1879, the Supreme Court had upheld the idea that juries could be limited to men. 
1927, only 19 states had allowed women the right to serve on juries. Why is this? Well, there's a basic simplistic argument about the, quote, defect of sex. Part of it was a belief that the primary obligation of women was to their families. Part of it was a belief that women should not be um, uh, see, uh, should not see in court the dastardly and, and dirty crimes that they might be listening to. Um, it was thought that women would be too sympathetic to defendants. And if you look at the cartoon at the bottom there, it was also presumed that in a lengthy jury hearing, men and women together might be fraternizing or doing some other uh, shenanigans in, in the uh, juror room. That issue was upheld in 1961 in a case called Hoyt versus Florida. In this case, Gwendolyn Hoyt had been married to an abusive husband. After one particularly uh, deep argument, she picked up a device and hit him over the head, knocking him out, and he dies two days later. She's charged with second degree murder. And an all male, male jury in 25 minutes convicts her. She brings suit saying that she has not been represented by a jury of her peers. She's not had due process and a fair trial. The Supreme Court in 1961 rejected her plea and affirmed the idea that the primary duty for women would be in the home. Four years later, in 1965, the case of White v. Crook. It's not a case in, in the Supreme Court. It's a circuit case. This case involves a number of parties, the ACLU primarily, but this famous woman, Polly Murray, she's seen in the images here with her colleague, Dorothy Kenyon, and this amazing judge, Frank Johnson. Johnson was famous during the uh, Selma March for voting rights. And if you see on the right there, the federal building in Montgomery is named after him. And there's a beautiful placard honoring his commitment to civil liberties. In this case, this case is about uh, a reaction to an all white jury refusing to convict the man who murdered Jonathan Daniels, a, a fairly unknown civil rights worker, but a beautiful human being who was murdered in August of 1965, just outside of Selma. So in response to that, this group leads the charge and, and Frank Johnson will declare in the Fifth Circuit, then the Fifth Circuit, that um, you cannot bar African-Americans or women from juries. And 10 years after that, the Supreme Court finally enabled the equality of sex opportunity in juries and women could then serve on those juries. If we go beyond that with juries, we look at the case that happened last year uh, regarding Curtis Flowers. He is shown in the upper left. Bradley Balco is a writer that uh, looks at what he would consider excessive police force and the militarization of police. He cited this wonderful podcast called In the Dark. Mr. Flowers uh, was implicated in the murder of four people in 1996. His claims about what happened and the state's claims are very different. Regardless, there were six trials. He's convicted in four of them. The real difficulty is that his death sentence was before almost unanimously, really virtually, an all-white jury pool in those six trials. Not absolutely, but almost. And uh, the Mississippi uh, prosecutor uh, was found in 41 of the 42 times he could use a peremptory challenge to a jury. He struck black juries. Now, it was a violation to use race in selection of juries. That's a federal violation. But there were coded things. So he said he didn't like a woman's hair, didn't like the way a man spoke, didn't like various things. The Supreme Court last year, with the writing uh, done by Justice Kavanaugh, had uh, put overturned these decisions and will go back to a new trial. But the big thing that happens here is that this idea that juries um, are going to be less racially selective because we have studies that suggest they're still that way. But um, um, Kavanaugh's opinion is, is pretty harsh in saying that this flies in the face of Batson, which was that ruling that required you to not consider race in the selection of juries. The jury pool question and decision-making 
got even more interesting and complicated just about a week ago in, in, in April of this year. In the case, Ramos versus Louisiana. And in this image, you see one of the interest groups that helped bring this case, Promise of Justice Initiative. This case involves Mr. Ramos, who was um, accused of murdering a young woman in New Orleans in 2016. He asserts innocence. But in this case, he was convicted in a non-unanimous jury pool. So there were two states, Louisiana and Oregon, that in the past decades have allowed juries in capital or felony cases to, in, in felony cases, to not be unanimous. At the federal level, it's been required for a number of years that juries have to be unanimous. States, it's their decision. And in this case, there were two, two states that still allowed non-unanimous pools. So this case will be about the Sixth Amendment right in front of a jury, but also, again, the due process clause. And what happens is this. This goes back to an, uh, an English uh, jurist and theorist, William Blackstone, who in 1769 had declared that the unanimous suffrage of 12, the unanimous suffrage of 12, of the defendant's equals and neighbors. So you get our idea of a jury of your peers and the unanimity issue there. He had said that was of crucial need in a, in a system of justice. So the 14th Amendment didn't quite declare that, but here we have the Supreme Court overturning uh, another decision. And if we look at this, you'll see a couple of interesting issues with this non-unanimous jury pool system here. So in the case of Louisiana, when Justice Gorsuch writes the opinion in uh, Ramos v. Louisiana, he cites the racial implications of its founding. So in the, roughly the 1880s, Louisiana added this um, ability to have 10 or 11 votes to convict because almost clearly, as, as Justice Gorsuch writes, they wanted to make sure that they could guarantee that a, a black defendant would be convicted, even if there was maybe one white person willing to not convict. In the case of Oregon, the bias is towards um, Jewish people. So there was a grisly murder in 1933 of two people, Jimmy Walker and this woman. The person charged with the crime was Jack Silverman. And Mr. Silverman was not convicted of murder, he was sentenced to a lesser crime. And the community, rose up in anger, at least part of it did. And they got this uh, non-unanimous uh, system passed uh, a couple years later. That a system was upheld in the case of Apodaca versus Oregon in 1972. This particular case didn't involve a murder. It involved a few guys who were involved in, in, in a felony robbery, I think it was. And they claimed that being convicted um, by a 10-2 vote violated their sixth Amendment rights. The Supreme Court, though, ruled against them with only one uh, dissenting vote, I believe it was. Um, and in this case, the Supreme Court said that common sense judgment, not unanimity, was good enough. No 14th Amendment protection there. As of last week, that 14th Amendment protection stands within all 50 states in, in, in the union. If we move from the jury pool and we go to just a couple of quick items on the Fifth Amendment, you know that you cannot be charged twice for the same crime if you have been acquitted, not a hung jury, but acquitted. And remember, the same action can, can apply to two different crimes. So a murder that is involved with certain other things, drug trafficking, uh, terroristic threats, uh, and a, a number of other crimes it can also be considered a federal crime. So if you're tried in the state and acquitted, the federal government can prosecute you. And the Miranda warnings that you're very familiar with against uh, that uh, enable you to refuse to speak um, and to have your attorney present with you. The area you want to focus on now is the Fourth Amendment, though. The Fourth Amendment is going to weave in issues of the exclusionary rule and concepts of privacy here. This case involves uh, Dalray Mapp, and the case is Mapp v. Ohio. I had mentioned it in the Warren Court 
uh, Warren era uh, lecture I gave. This case, though, I want to highlight. It is not the origin of the exclusionary rule. This is the idea that evidence seized improperly cannot be introduced at trial, will be excluded. That concept was embedded in our system in 1914 in weeks, but that applied only to the federal government. So what Matthew Ohio does, it's gonna incorporate and require that states respect this basic idea. So the case is this, police are looking for a suspect, Virgil Ochiltree. They believe he may have gone into Dalry and Mapp's residence. Knock on the door, demand to, ent to enter and look for him. She requests a warrant. They don't have one, so they show a paper. They enter. They don't find Ochiltree, but they find what is considered obscenity, pornography. Mapp claims it is in, in a box. It was the possession of a previous tenant. They don't uh, accept this argument, and she's convicted of that. Her case will, that was in the late 50s, her case will win in the Supreme Court in 1961 and leads to that concept of the exclusion of evidence that is not fairly and constitutionally seized. Similarly, a few years later in Katz v. the United States, this is the case also from the Warren Court lecture that involved uh, Mr. Katz, who was doing some nasty stuff dealing with interstate gambling. And he would use a payphone, that is not the payphone, it's just an image I have, um, of a payphone. And so the government tapped the wire going into the payphone. He claimed it was an illegal invasion of his right to privacy and his right to be free from a, um, an unreasonable search. The police said, we didn't invade your privacy, it was just that line. So the Supreme Court hears this case in a, in a vote of seven to one, identifies that persons, not places, have the protection, persons, not places, and that you should have, quote, a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's really interesting because it comes only two years after Griswold, in which we established that concept of privacy. So there's a real nice discussion of that concept in the mid-60s here. If we look then at the shifting grounds, though, what I see is this. You have sort of a high tide of the protection of the rights of the accused and really having a detail-oriented set of prosecution. Since the mid-80s, though, I'm going to argue, we've seen a rolling back of those rights and a shift. Some of that is known as plain view. If you're pulled over uh, by, by officers uh, for a legitimate reason and there is a bag of marijuana in the front seat. They don't need a warrant. They don't need probable cause. It is in plain sight. If you are pulled over and you consent to having your uh, trunk opened, they uh, may seize that evidence. There's certain automobile exceptions because you could speed away and there has to be some probable cause for that. We'll deal with dogs later. How about stop and frisk? This case really is interesting because it's been discussed in our, our political culture over the last five years a lot. The case that established it as a foundation was from oh, 60 years ago, T Terry v. Ohio, which is 1963. The basic idea is this, a veteran police officer spies up a couple guys that look a bit shady. They're kind of uh, hanging around uh, uh, this, this office, this store. They're looking inside it. So, you know, he's got years of experience. He's got his instincts. He goes up to them and discusses, asks them a few questions. They mumble a little bit. So he requests. Now he can, for his own safety, in sort of the wingspan of your arms, police officers can uh, have a little bit of latitude with that. So he gives them what's known as a pat down. And he discovers that there is a weapon. He continues this process and he finds, uh, I think, a second weapon. They will challenge this issue and say, there was no probable cause. This guy had a hunch, no probable cause. They didn't in fact do anything that would warrant being stopped. The Supreme Court upholds the stop and frisk and as, as, as being the pat down being only minimally necessary. It's, it's a minimal intrusion, and it's not that big of a violation. There was one dissenter, William O. Douglas, and he pens a powerful dissent. And this is where, again, where I suggest that you look at dissents and not just the holding. But in this case, 
he argues that we have moved away from the long-held standard of probable cause to only, quote, reasonable suspicion. And he believed that you would give the police the power of the magistrate. See, the judge would have to determine whether the police come with legitimate probable cause to issue a warrant. It's that check and balance that Madison spoke about that all our framers uh, looked at. In 2013, one version of stop and frisk was ruled unconstitutional. That was the one that's discussed a lot these days, New York City stop and frisk. But it did not overturn the concept of stop and frisk. It was rejected because of the means and the way that New York City carried it out, which was disproportionately impacting people of color. So if we go from that concept of reasonable suspicion, you're getting into a concept called good faith. And the good faith exception would probably be the broadest term to use here. And it's, it's codified in Supreme Court decision in 1984 in two of them, U.S. versus Leon and Massachusetts v. Shepard. The details I'm not worried about with you understanding here. But they generally in a bunch of cases I'm going to discuss here, are asking whether the police themselves act in good faith, even if a relatively minor mistake happened along the way, a clerical error on the warrant, or in the case in Massachusetts, as you see, that the court itself was closed because it was the weekend, and so a previously filled out warrant was used. And the court will make decisions in these two cases that uphold the right, suggesting that the officers themselves took reasonable steps. And so what the basic idea is this, the exclusionary rule is meant to roll back bad conduct, not to be so detail oriented that good faith conduct would be deterred. And so those decisions are connected with this case, Graham v. O'Connor. Now, the case of Graham v. O'Connor is a powerful one. It involves Dethorne Graham, a diabetic. He was in, in, in the process of having a, uh, an insulin reaction, which means his blood sugar was falling rapidly. So was, he asked his friend William Berry to drive him to uh, a nearby convenience store. He was going to go in and purchase some orange juice. He gets out, runs into the store, there's a long line, runs back out. Gets in the car, they're going to go to another store. Across the street was an officer, Officer Khan. He thinks perhaps something untoward happened in the store, maybe it was a robbery. And so what he does is he follows them, and about half a mile, he pulls them over. Mr. Barry tells Officer Connor, my friend's a diabetic and he needs to get some sugar in him immediately. Connor tells them, you sit there, you stay there. I'm going to check out what's happening back at the store. He calls for backup. As uh, Graham's blood sugar drops, uh, a diabetic's thinking is deeply impaired. His ability to speak is deeply impaired. So he ends up jumping out of the car and running around it twice and then collapsing nearly in a diabetic coma. By the time he wakes up, the backup police had arrived. And he tells them also, you can look in my pocket or in my wallet and there's a, a, a paper telling you that I'm diabetic. They allegedly tell him, shut up. He is mumbling. They allegedly say that he's drunk. And they shove him against the car. Mr. Graham says they roughed him up pretty bad, beat him pretty bad, and they even broke his ankle. Eventually, Connor comes back and says, you know, the store tells me nothing happened. This dude's okay. The police take him back to his residence and they think, okay, all's good. The Thorn Graham will get aid to bring a lawsuit. And in this case, it is a unanimous decision that the court says the officers were not guilty of unreasonable conduct. So Chief Justice Rehnquist writes the opinion and it's whether it's objectionably reasonable in light of facts and circumstances, not looking at underlying intent or motivation. And the use of force must be judged by a reasonable officer, not with 2020 hindsight. Now, on one hand, I think this is perfectly logical. But on the other hand, there's two, two parts of this 
ruling right here that befuddle me. The first is the facts and circumstances. On two occasions, the police were told that Mr. Graham was diabetic. And then the underlying intent and motivation. We understand very well today the challenges of implicit bias. And if you don't ask the question whether that police or anyone would ask questions that differ based on race, class, gender, orientation, or whatever implicit element, it may be very difficult to guarantee equal treatment under the law. So if we look on from that and we get the idea that we're having a struggle between security and good faith and protection, uh, equal protection and due process. So we go to three cases briefly here. These cases have, have different details, but they involve sort of minor elements, I'd say. So if you look at this, um, the case of Evans and the case of Herring deal with the, the, the quirks and the clerical errors and a database that wasn't updated and whether police acting in good faith, even though the warrant itself had a factual uh, background error, is that a problem? The court upholds this. In the case of Kabbalahs, it involved police stopping a motorist. And the motorist was stopped and the police thought they smelled uh, marijuana. And so they call for a canine squad. The, the canine officer arrives, the dog sniffs around and uh, identifies that there is marijuana in the car and he's busted. He brings suit or his, his, his lawyers bring suit and the Supreme Court will rule on a couple of reasons. The first is this. The idea is, is that there is no legitimate privacy concern because the, the canine dogs never invaded his personal privacy. They just sniffed around the car and alerted to something that then created probable cause. Secondly, they said, he was only detained for 10 minutes. And those two issues may make reasonable sense. But the dissents in, in both the case of Evans and Kabbalahs were from Ruth Bader Ginsburg and William Rehnquist. And there it's sort of like this crazy combination of these two coming together. And in, um, in, in, in the first case in Evans, they make an argument that says, right process should happen throughout the system that the police are only one part of the criminal justice system. The clerks, the administrators, the attorneys, they're all part of that. In the case of Kabbalah's, Ginsburg makes a neat argument that says, so the fact that you don't have probable cause and you bring a, a dog sniffing, uh, a, 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 a canine dog with you, would that enable me to bring as an officer a canine dog into the parking lot of the mall and sniff around until I found a vehicle that had some drugs in it. No probable cause. In the case of Herring, this was a case in which uh, Justice Roberts will write the opinion. And in this opinion, he makes the argument that that database error was about exclusion has always been our last resort, not our first principle. And so in many ways you see between the protection of it in Dalray Mapp's case of 1961 and the reinforcement of it over the next few years. By 40 years later, 40 to 50 years later, it's crumbling a bit, but not absolutely, not absolutely. In 2013, there was a case in which police wanted to see, they had a hunch that this car, this gentleman was involved in some illicit drug activity. So they put a GPS tracking system tapped it in the, you know, underneath his bumper and uh, wanted to see the route he took to see if he went through and to sort of known drug areas. They did this without a warrant and the Supreme Court struck that idea down. Case of Riley versus Carpenter. This was, this involved um, police looking for um, uh, Mr. Riley who was involved uh, or uh, suspected in a shooting, a gang shooting a few days earlier. He has stopped in a car that wasn't the car he was in a few days earlier. Police take his phone, they look in his phone, and they see pictures of him 
with other members of this suspected gang. This case is a major uh, decision by John Roberts. And what he writes about here is this. In the modern world, previously, we could look through your wallet if the police stopped. Your wallet could be looked and seized. We could look in your pockets to see if you have a weapon or anything dangerous on you. But the phone, the modern smartphone, uh, can contains so much personal information, so much of your personal records, that it's far different than a wallet. Moreover, the information really isn't on your person, it's up in the cloud. And so these two cases give us a sense that just maybe there's still some of the protections on the Fourth and Sixth Amendment there. My lasting concerns. We look at this, sovereign immunity is a tricky issue, but in general, not absolutely, in general, the state is protected from misdeeds in civil litigation generally. So if you are an officer of the state, whether a policeman or an attorney, you're not liable for acts committed here. Sometimes this means that police giving inaccurate or even perhaps false testimony cannot be prosecuted um, in civil court for that. Or TSA officials, as was determined in 2018, you could not sue them under federal tort law uh, if they were guilty of being physically rough. Those are some concerns we have. We look to then the concern about effectiveness of counsel. Sure, you have the right to counsel, but do you have the right to good counsel? In 2000, the Supreme Court said reasonably effective. But the, the issue we have here is this. If you're in need of counsel, you're likely poor, right? And what we look at is this. There's some 15,000 public defenders out there, court-appointed uh, defenders. That's a large number. But there are millions of suspects out there, millions of inmates that have to be relitigated. And if you look at this, tax dollars pay for this, and people, they don't want to pay taxes. The, 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 the fees and, and the payment is less. The Brennan Center estimates that public defenders spend six minutes in a hearing. Another study found that in our public dollars, roughly $150 billion a year spent in the criminal justice system of prosecution. Roughly 50% goes to police and prosecutors. 40 some percent goes to administration of justice. And two to 3% goes to help for the indigent. It seems like we don't have equal opportunity in that courtroom. In 2019, the court did uphold the right of, of a person who had an effective counsel. Sometimes it's been if the, if the lawyer falls asleep or was drunk. But in this case, Justice Thomas said, what we've decided as a court, the majority has decided at least, is that the defendant always wins. And there is really no particular level of reliability mandated in the Constitution. In this case, Tim's versus Indiana, it was a big case in 2019. This deals with the concept of civil asset forfeiture. This is long, been, uh, not long, probably been debated about the last decade and a number of uh, great studies and efforts to, to fight this. Civil asset forfeiture, about four decades old, primarily arose out of the war on drugs and was uh, an effort to not merely seize the, the drug product or jail, the drug trafficker, but seize the vehicle. So maybe that plane that flew drugs in to our southern states, perhaps, right? Mr. Tim's here, not a, not a nice dude. He was trafficking heroin, right? He stopped, they seize it, they bust him, all good. He is convicted and given a $1,200 fine. But State of Indiana also seized his Land Rover, and he's showing the picture of that here. That Land Rover was worth, uh, give or take, $40,000, $42,000. By law, the largest fine that he could receive for this violation in Indiana was $10,000. So effectively, they're seizing the asset, the vehicle. He had purchased the vehicle with insurance money from the father or grandfather's death. So it wasn't purchased with drug money, but they seized this. And the Supreme Court in 2019 rules that 
This is a violation of the Eighth Amendment's excessive punishment. And, and, and it's a real important moment because it, it, it would be the reversal, I think, of a growing trend to use civil asset forfeiture there. Um, that was the, the writing, I think, of Neil Gorsuch there. How about private prisons? 10% of our prison population in the United States is held in private prisons. But 70%, 70% of immigrant detainees are in private prisons. And they use what's known as a voluntary work program. That voluntary work program uh, allows you to work for private companies for profit. You're paid $1 a day. That rate was set in 1950 and codified in the 1970s. Is that a modern convict leasing system? How about states that ban certain books? We know the evidence says that literacy, improved literacy reduces recidivism. New Jersey bans reading the new Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander's wonderful book. I might get that because it's describing how the uh, prison industrial system has incarcerated uh, black men and Latino men in a new Jim Crow. Arizona, I don't get it with Batman I be beholden. Texas, Monty Python, where's Waldo? Hmm, Freakonomics? 11,000 texts on their ban list. What's not on their list? Mein Kampf. So what we see here is some limits on those who are held in prison and on their way to prison. But if we go to this final slide, Voltaire, Blackstone, and Ben Franklin. All of them expressed a sentiment that is at the core of traditional ideas of American criminal justice. It's better that we allow on occasion a guilty person to go free than one innocent person to suffer. <laughs>